We have Jeremy J. McNeely, uh, Juris Doctorate, with the Fifth Circuit uh, Public Defender's Office, Richland County. Now, I, uh, I wanted someone here to, to talk about this, this Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Columbia movement, and I couldn't get a hold of Travis, the, the main fellow I'd found in the paper, so I called Frank Knapp. Frank had uh, Jeremy on earlier, the week, the radio, and then I talked to Jeremy, he sent me, sent me his CV and some background information, and I was uh, very excited when I saw his background and the type of person he is, looking back at his work record. Just let me go over a little bit of this. He uh, has a bachelor's degree uh, from, I won't go through all the details, he, he was an Army ROTC um, from Milligan College, played, played a basketball at Milligan College. Then uh, from Milligan, uh, he got his master's degree at Princeton. Uh, I'll go through all the details and all the other positive things at Princeton. And he went to Duke Law School, Duke Divinity School in Europe, another master's degree. He went to the uh, University of Oxford in England in 2008. Uh, did studies there and did his Juris Doctorate degree at uh, Ohio State University. Now, I don't know how he got with all these other schools and got with Ohio, Ohio State. That's not like going to Auburn or Clemson, I guess. Nothing wrong there. Nothing wrong there. I've got there myself. Nothing like going to Clemson. Uh, <laughs> The bar exam July 2010. Uh, and the interesting thing, how many of you uh, read the, some of these financial times? Uh, let's see. Uh, you've written Yahoo Finance, MSNBC, CBS, Market Watch. Uh, it's over 500 publications in the, the Motley Fool, which I used to read quite a bit. So a lot of economic background. Over 500 publications. So we've got a person here who understands the economy, and most of us in this room agree on uh, the economy of the problems. And it's, it's Jose Correa is with us, who uh, in 2008, for those of you who were on the Long Haul campaign, Jose was the primary driver in South Carolina for organizational structure for Long Haul. And uh, I see a glimmer of that reemergence here in this, in this event. So, uh, and I took it upon myself to make up an agenda for Jeremy, and I just went over it two minutes this beforehand. So he's having off the cuff to look at the agenda. So I put down uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, so he's doing this kind of unprepared. So, you know, give him some leeway on this. So Jeremy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us. Give him a hand. Spontaneous. I got a call yesterday afternoon, in fact, and we spoke briefly. And uh, I actually didn't know I was going to be the central spokesperson this morning. I thought they would be talking. So uh, I am a little bit unprepared, but I've been talking about the issues for a long time. So uh, I feel like I bring some stuff to the table. And um, you know, uh, I got a phone call and I was thinking about it. And, um, two stories come to mind. So I'll just start off with two stories. And uh, I think that might be a good segue. Uh, first, is a story about my uncle. He came uh, back from the work uh, uh, late in the afternoon and saw some cracking on his uh, on his walls. Didn't think much of it. He, you know, put some mortar back in there and, and repainted it over it. And thought everything was okay. Uh, about a couple weeks later, that cracking reappeared, but it's deeper and longer than it was the next time. So he filled it in again and repainted it. You know, I thought that might take care of it. Well, about a month later, that crack had extended pretty much across the entire wall. And at that point, he knew there was something more severe than just a cracking on the wall. They contacted a uh, structural engineer that came out, and the uh, structural engineer said, look, the problem isn't the cracking on the wall, it's, it's a faulty foundation. And until you fix the core problem, you're always going to have those cracks on the walls. And the reason why that story comes to mind is I think that uh, what the Tea Party and uh, Libertarian movements have been about, and what the street movement is about, I think there's some core concerns that uh, uh, there's some central foundational problems that we have to address uh, before we can get to all, all kinds of issues that 
divide us on a lot of different things. And I think there's some agreement, there's some <coughs> core problems that need to be addressed. The second thing, the story comes to mind, uh, right after I got off the phone uh, with you, was that uh, it's John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is really uh, an interesting story. Uh, for those of you uh, may remember, uh, Jesus uh, decides to go into uh, the land of Samaria. Okay? Now, the reason why that's really, really unique in his day is that Jesus didn't do that in his day. All right? Samarians uh, were, Samaritans were considered uh, basically uh, those on the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, you don't go on the other side of the railroad tracks. Well, Jesus decides to do that, all right? And, and not only did he decide to do that, he decides to talk with a, with a woman, which is pretty unique also in his day as a rabbi. And what's really uh, stands out to you in that story is that where he meets her is at Jacob's well. Now, that's really important. In fact, Jacob's well is repeated about three or four times in a span of a couple verses, which for those who uh, you know, um, study the scriptures, there's a point of emphasis that's found when there's a repetition. It repeats the words of Jacob's well. Okay? And the reason why that's important is because even though the Jews disagreed with the Samaritans on a lot of things, and frankly couldn't stand them, and even though the Samaritans couldn't stand the Jews, and they disagreed a lot of things, they both loved Jacob. And so the point of that story is that Christ went to where there was common ground. And the reason why that story comes to mind for me is that I believe there is some common ground between what's going on about to start tomorrow here in Columbia and uh, what you guys have been about. And I think if we can start from that, that there is common ground, uh, I think that can be a, uh, a uh, kind of a starting point for something fresh, maybe. Well, I was on the radio earlier this week. In fact, that was uh, something I, I made a point to point out, that um, you know, this is an opportunity not just for those uh, who might identify with themselves on the left-hand side of the political spectrum, but in my opinion, it's an opportunity for uh, um, folks on every side of the spectrum to come out, voice their concerns for what's going on in the economy and the political system. Um, so I'll start there. Uh, just put down some of the key points that uh, the first one is the overview of uh, Occupy Columbia. How that started this, this movement is um, over the summer uh, a group of concerned citizens sent out a call uh, on the internet for those concerned citizens in Canada, let me point out, uh, put out a call on the internet to, to have folks show up at Wall Street to protest what's going on. That's an important point, I think. Um, and, and what happened was in September, of course, as you, as you well know, people showed up and they uh, started protesting. Um, it quickly spread into a lot of other cities. Um, and, and now it's going back into back into Canada, back and you know, it's going it's one starting in Great Britain and in Europe. Uh, I think that's an important point uh, that has at its origins almost an international beginnings, and uh, it's carrying over that way worldwide. The point of that is uh, the corporations that are dominating the political conversation. Uh, be they the big banks on Wall Street, uh, big oil or big defense contractors. Um, you know, they're multinational corporations and they operate uh, all over the globe and, and citizens in those countries are dealing with some of the similar issues that we're dealing with. So I think that's, uh, you know, so that's the beginnings of how this all started. It quickly carried over to other cities. Uh, I kind of just monitored it, uh, what's going on and um, took a great interest in it, um, and somebody had started up a website that was a kind of a central hub uh, for those that wanted to start a similar uh, protest in their own city. So I actually got on there to register Columbia, South Carolina, and found out minutes before that I had done that, somebody else beat me to it. 
and they set up a web page, and then a whole bunch of people we just met online. And um, we had our first meeting this past Sunday. It was over 100 people there. Most of the people, all but two or three, I met for the very first time. We literally just found each other online. Uh, there were some attorneys there, there were some business people, there were a lot of young people, there were, uh, surprisingly a lot, a lot of older people. Uh, they were just uh, very concerned with what's going on. Um, so it was very spontaneous how this happened. And it literally happened uh, no more than two weeks ago. So the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you guys is, you know, bizarre, to say the least. You know? So, uh, you know, like we had the first meeting then on, on a Sunday. Uh, we decided to uh, put it for the 15th. Uh, the reason why that date was selected is because um, the uh, their aim is to have a large rally in New York City on the 15th and, uh, and have that go on, go on in multiple cities around the United States. So that was why that date was selected. Uh, so that's kind of you know, how it started. Uh, in terms of what it's about, you know, the big media will, uh, it's been one of their questions, uh, you know, what's the uh, main, name? what's your primary demand? And I just think that's simply uh, premature at this point. And what I pointed out on the um, NAS radio uh, show earlier this week is that you can't make a demand uh, unless you've got something on power to, at the table. And, you know, right, you don't have the power unless you have people show up. So, you know, we, we don't have uh, massive massive amount of resources uh, like the big corporations do. We can't buy off all of them. So our power is in the people. And if the people don't show up, we don't have any power. So to say we have to make any kind of demand whatsoever is to me is pretty, totally premature. Um, if there's a, a rallying point, however, it would be this, that uh, we are frustrated with where the economy is where the economy is at now, and where we see it going. And we view at the central, at the core of that, uh, of that problem is a political system bought out, a, a two-party duopoly that has been bought out. And I'm talking on both sides of the aisle, and when I was a Frank Nash show, uh, I was just as critical of Obama, somebody who I voted for, and, and for the record, I voted on both sides of the aisle. Uh, so you, so you know where I come from a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in a uh, <coughs> extremely uh, conservative, Christian evangelical household. My family is still that. Um, to say that some of my family has some problems with some of my position now, you know, I think it goes without saying. So, uh, but let me also say that in my journey, my intellectual journey, and my work, I have never once wavered, ever, uh, in my core belief system, and that is uh, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. He has shaped my theological worldview, that theological worldview has shaped my ethical system, my ethical system shapes my way I view policy. So never once have I wavered in that, and I think that's important. Uh, you know, uh, poor point. I don't know, you know if you are a Christian or not, but uh, I, it tends to be a label that those who now, those who hold uh, some position on the left, that somehow they lost their uh, faith a little bit. I can tell you, that's frankly not true. Um, I may also say, well, that's some common ground. I'm not a, uh, a Marxist rebel. <laughs> Somebody has that point of view. Um, you know, I have it for the Molly Fool. I do believe that some of the problems that we'll be facing down in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, business has to be a part of the solution. It has to be a part of it. There's no question in my mind. You look at some of the, uh, the growth in the global population, that's going to be what they're predicting by 2030. You have to have uh, certain technologies that can accommodate. You know, and the folks who bring that technology to bear in business. Uh, so this is one example where I think uh, business has to be a part of the solution. Uh, but I do think that there's been some problems the way business has been done for a while in this country. I think there's too much of a buddy-buddy uh, uh, system going on in Washington, D.C. and Wall Street. And 
big oil, big oil and big defense. And I would ultimately, if there's one thing I would like to see, it may not ever happen in my lifetime, may not happen in my children's lifetime. But I do think one day, whenever that is, there will be a separation of, of the corporate influence in the state. <coughs> I read a lot of history, and at uh, one, one point the we had to have the separation of church and state. And as you know, the, uh, the church for a thousand years dominated the political spectrum. Dominated. You could not think beyond politics without thinking about the church. And of course, that started to change with Martin Luther and went on down the line. And uh, I always see that that's where we're headed. Again, it might be a thousand years from now. But the point is, is working towards a, a more fair system where uh, we don't have a, a duopoly, uh, two party duopoly dominating conversation being dictated by uh, big money. Yeah, and I, some of the frustrations I think we can share. I'll put a couple examples. I get really, really frustrated when uh, I get Senator Bill Graham, who uh, repealed what I think was an important uh, uh, act, uh, Bank Act of 1933, to provide the investment and uh, um, uh, deposit uh, banking system, repeals that, signed off by Clinton, and then retires and then takes a job with UBS. To me, something stinks about that. Okay? The, old, the saying is, if it looks like shit, it smells like shit, you bet that it is shit. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think a lot of people, Americans in general, agree with me on that. And I think you all agree with me on that too. I'll give you another example. Um, this is the most recent one. Um, Judd Gray. Okay? Now here's a guy who, who fought tooth and nail uh, against some of uh, the big five banks and their practices. Fought it, fought it, fought it. You know, gave his principles of why he fought it, okay? Defending capitalism, okay? Well, he retires right after that, and guess what kind of gig he got after that? Golden Sachs, okay? Uh, to me, that stinks. And the people who are going to show up tomorrow don't like that. Fundamentally, do not like that. And, uh, you know, the group tomorrow that took showed up there, we're as diverse in our perspectives as probably some of y'all in sitting here. I mean, all over the spectrum. Uh, but I think at the core, we feel like until you get the uh, <coughs> corporate influence out of politics, you can't really have a serious conversation about the different uh, perspectives we bring to the table. You just can't, because it's going to be dictated by a, a duopoly uh, who you know, is largely influenced by corporations. So. Um, What's the difference between what you're talking uh, about and fascism? Let me finish this point oh, okay. and then we'll get the questions. Uh, Jerry, where are we here? We don't remember. Uh, so commonalities, maybe? Right. Uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, I, I think commonalities would be, obviously, if it's going with what's going on with the economic uh, environment. Uh, now, I know the solutions that uh, you all propose would be you know, different than the solutions that we would propose, but quite frankly, it doesn't matter what you guys say, what I say at this point, because uh, until you have power at the broker's table, um, uh, nobody's going to listen to you or me. So, um, I think that's a common, a common ground. Um, you know, I, I, you know, Pretty familiar with uh, some positions of, uh, uh, of the libertarian movement. You know, I know Ron Paul is uh, you know, very much uh, opposed to this um, uh, kind of military-industrial complex that's uh, been a way for us to throw our uh, troops all over the world and uh, at a great cost to both human life and also uh, economic uh, expense. And um, I think that you'll find that may even show up tomorrow share that same concern. Um, so that would be a, another common, commonality. Um, I said, who's welcome to attend? Uh, again, it was really a spontaneous thing. And what I said to, to Frank Nat is like, nobody ever contacted me to get this thing, this ball rolling. Nobody. I had no connections, political connections you know, at all. Uh, if I had any 
deep real connections there would be on the Republican side. I come from a Republican family. My uncle was a long time uh, state senator in Ohio. So if I had any connections, it would be that. Uh, but nobody's contacted me. And it's just, it's, uh, it's become a spontaneous event because people are deeply concerned with what's going on and deeply hurting. People in my own family are hurting. And uh, it's natural, when that's the case, to voice your frustrations. So who's welcome to attend? Anybody who's frustrated with what's going on, basically. Any final comments? Someone? No, I'll say uh, enough. Okay, well, first, I want to thank you for making the presentation. Okay? Let's give him a round of applause, folks. <laughs> Table, hot seat. Yeah. So, so now we got these people can ask anything. Sure. So, right. uh, well, are you having speakers? I, I don't think it's funny. I had a question for Frank actually. I know some of the other events have been doing that, uh, mm -hmm. but they the other events have been going on for a while, and I think maybe down the line that's probably something that uh, we consider doing. I think that the first day of it is really just to uh, get people to show up, and anybody who wants to speak can speak. I think how they're doing is some kind of a uh, uh, Queuing system where you put your name in and say, hey, I want to say a few words and wait your turn. And that's how they're going to do it tomorrow. Jim, let me ask a, a kind of a tough question. I talked to Bill Frady yesterday about you know, coming and you know, his first comment was like communist manifesto. Apparently there's some kind of manifesto with the Wall Street crowd uh -huh. and certain things they want for uh -huh. bigger government and free stuff. And, uh, in, what, in talking to you, I got the impression that you weren't connected directly with the centralized planning. I, yeah, I've never been contacted. Now, whether Travis has been contacted, uh, Travis Bland, before, right. uh, he's been working with other groups. I don't know. Uh, I have read the document he's referring to. Um, I do share a lot of the uh, um, positions on there. Um, again, you know, we know that your position is a lot of things will be very different than my position is a lot of things, right? But again, uh, whether or not there's common ground uh, that we can uh, voice our opposition to, I, what I see is a system that uh, is designed to extinguish your points of view and my points of view from the public conversation. And if there is common ground, can we work from that? Well, Corey, Corey you can ask any questions. Corey. Oh. Um, Gary, thank you so much for coming out here. It takes a lot of courage to, to start voicing your opinion, especially in today's time. Appreciate your faith as far as Christ. I, I know, likewise, Christian in this country was founded as a Christian nation, and obviously we're in peril times right now. Um, my question arises with the fact that you know I don't know exactly about these movements. And it's kind of great, kind of learn from these guys that are the, the controlling yeah. factors. Like Man, uh, Ron Emanuel said one time, you can't let a crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. You can't let any big go to waste, mm -hmm. regardless if you got differences. Yeah. Um, but you know, is it your opinion based on Wall Street versus Washington that corporate interests obviously are dictating law and policy in America? I'll make the question about that. And if, if that being so, so, um, you know, obviously the structure of law has been compromised to some degree. And uh, so what, What obviously, the, you know, I come more from a, a Ron Paul tonight, I guess, maybe I should say Austrian type mentality of thought economics. <clears throat> um, you know, most of us don't like the fiat system of money. Uh, it totally erodes the foundational elements of this country uh, as far as real money is concerned. So, what can we do tomorrow to, or what can be done, and what is the best catalyst for this movement as far as trying to get to the root of the cause? And, and many of uh, my colleagues, in our opinion, the root cause is not really corporate entities, it's the monetary system uh, that has been compromised in this country for many years, and then, of course, the lack of vigilance and activity and action to correct it. Uh, so you create these bubbles and in the interim there's an alignment between corporations, but in the foundational group calls, the ones that are appropriating a lot of these uh, bubbles and are managing and, and manipulating the markets of the Federal Reserve System. So um, in tomorrow's activity, as far as focusing on Wall Street, uh, can you clarify that how that really is a main root cause versus something like what Washington has done and is uh, the, the, the 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 um, the secrecy behind the monetary system with the, the control of the Federal Reserve that actually manages the GDP and has a 
about 60 countries around the minimum 60 countries around the world under this particular bomb. So can you elaborate on how that correlates to what causes? Yeah, I, I mean, I've read a lot about uh, you all's perspective. Uh, an economist who I read weekly is uh, somebody probably from Baltimore, Ron Paul, uh, Ron Paul King, somebody that's probably familiar with it's John Malden. Know if John Bolton or not, but it's out a weekly uh, uh, article, like very li libertarian minded. Uh, so I understand that, that mindset. I don't agree with everything with John Bolton, but he brings lots of people that I do agree with. Um, but you have to look at, you know, when you look at the 2008 crisis and how that transpired and the conversations that went back door and the influence that Goldman Sachs and other corporations had, okay, and we found out.